Hello and welcome to Profiles with Paulette Payne. I'm your host, Paulette Payne. Um, thank you for joining us for this four-part series entitled Decriminalizing the Black Body. The mission of this four-part series is to create needed dialogue about systemic racism in America and the steps that must be taken in order to guarantee the right to liberty and justice for Black people. For the next four days, you will hear from scholars, parents, activists, and concerned citizens whose mission it is to do the same. Please take an opportunity to pose questions to guests in the thread of each segment. So as we are live, please, if you have questions for any of my guests, pose those questions in the thread of the broadcast and we'll be sure to get to those questions as soon as possible. All right, and now for part one of Hands Up, Black, Male, and Guilty in the Absence of Proof. Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit is a haunting narrative about the lynching of black people in America's South. The murder of jo George Floyd and others at the hand of law enforcement is considered to be by many a modern day lynching. However, instead of trees, streets across America have become modern day poplar trees. To be sure, black people are angry and frustrated. However, it is not George Floyd's death alone that has fueled this fire. What is being played out across this nation is a result of systemic racism, police brutality, and the disregard for black life. Today, I'm joined by thought leaders and change agents in their respective fields. I am honored to have them on the show. I'm honored to bring you their stories. And without further ado, I introduce to you Byron Hurt, who is a filmmaker and activist whose work includes hip hop, Beyond Beats and Rhymes, Soul Food Junkies, and I Am a Black Man, Masculinity in America, each addressing themes of identity politics, food disparities in the black community, and the demasculation of the black male body. Dr. Fahamu Piku is a visual artist who is internationally renowned for his work around black culture, identity, and activism. He also launched ADMA ATL to bring worldwide attention to black contemporary artists. Earl Mitchell is an author, lecturer, and historian whose research includes understanding Washington through a comedic lens. Joseph Collier, who we have yet to patch in tonight uh, because of technical difficulties, but hopefully he will be on, um, is a retired educator and social justice advocate. And last but not least, L. Michael Gibson is the principal founder of Black Bear Brotherhood and Faith Walk LLC, which is an advocacy and empowerment group for black men of size and the LGBTQ community. You can connect with each of these guests on social media and learn more about their activism. And now to the conversation. All right, gentlemen, first, thank you again for being on the show today. Uh, we have a lot to discuss. Um, as I was sharing with some of you at the open, you know, we have to take it back to the history, the history of black people in America. And you know, this is what we don't wanna talk about. This is what America has failed to talk about. Uh, it, it can be uncomfortable, but until we talk, change will not happen. So we we know, the, the four of us, five of us know that this criminalization of the black body started when the first Africans were brought to the Americas, to the American continent. Um, I wanna talk to you, I want you all to talk with me, share with the viewers your perspective on the impact that particular action has had and led us to modern day um, America. Fahamu, can you talk to us briefly? Not briefly, but share with us mm -hmm. your knowledge, your... Sure, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, be here and to be joined by uh, my fellow esteemed uh, panelists. Um, you know, I, I, I'll just kind of just jump right into it because it's, Everything that you're talking about is so present, um, and it's it, it's always been uh, present in my mind. Uh, the the ways in which the history of um, the treatment of Black people in this country continues to uh, animate the way we are treated 
right now um, in 2020. So, you know, 400 years, the, the, the narrative has been essentially the same. Um, you know, our humanity has been in question since those first um, enslaved Africans were brought to these shores. Um, they weren't seen as human beings. They were seen as property, as chattel, um, as labor. Um, and that was really the extent of their value. Outside of that, you know, they're viewed as a threat or they're viewed as something that is in need of reform. Um, and we see that kind of ideology continuing to um, inform the way society sees us, considers us, you know, so much so that we have to come up with a mantra that Black Lives Matter. Why do we have to say that? in 2020, like, you know, why do we have to explain that? Why do we have to spell that out uh, for you? Um, and, you know, one of the, the, the things that, I'm, that I've always done in my work, you know, though I'm depicting um, black men through the lens of various uh, stereotypes that Im impact us, ultimately what I'm getting at is, is the humanity of black men uh, and of black people, uh, you know, because I think that those conversations shift, those behaviors shift when we start to respect one another's humanity. Um, when we see each other beyond, you know, the something as as novel as the color of our skin, but when we actually see another human being uh, and engage with another another human being, then we have different types of conversations. We have different types of uh, engagements and interactions. Um, and so, you know, that's principle um, in, in my work is to you know, present uh, black men and black men's bodies in ways that allow for my audience to connect to the humanity um, of us um, and, and stop seeing us as a thing, as a black body, but as people. As people, that's, that's so critical. Um, you know, and we see this hashtag, all lives matter, that's so pervasive now um, and, and connection with Black Lives Matter, but it's so important to understand that, yeah, all lives matter, for sure, but because of what you've just shared, Fahamu, America, the world has had such a disdain for the Black body that, no, it's not all lives, it's Black lives, because if Black lives mattered, then all lives would matter. Byron, can you talk to us a little bit about um, your documentary um, around black masculinity and how that um, intertwines, connects with what we're dealing with modern day in terms of uh, the, the criminalization of black men and black women's bodies? Well, in my film, Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes, which I made several years ago, there's a scene um, that deconstructs the representations of black men in the film Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffin. Um, and in that film, um, many of you know, and I'm sure the brothers on this panel know that that was one of the first times that, you know, black men and, and black women for that matter, um, were depicted in very dehumanizing ways, right? Dehumanized ways. So that is when the, the, um, the, the birth of black men as beasts, black men as um, savage, black men as rapists, black men as oversexed, black men as, you know, all of the things that we, all of the, the various tropes that we have become accustomed to seeing in modern media uh, images and representations today, um, those, those representations began with that film. Not that those, those ideas began with the film, but the images, the representation um, began with that film. And those ideas about black men and black masculinity um, persist today. So when, you know, you and I walk down the street and we look at each other and we see human beings, we see other black men, white people on the other hand see um, a representation, something that they are have been trained and taught to be afraid of, to fear, to see as dangerous, or um, to question our motives or whether or not we are, you know, um, doing something illegal or not. And so those are the images and representations that we have had to live with for most of our lives. I'll never forget being a quarterback um, in college and playing football on Saturday afternoons 
and having people cheer for me, having white people cheer for me in the in the in the, um, in the stands, right in the stadium, and then coming back to campus on a Saturday night and walking down the street alone, you know, as a black man, and having the same people who cheered for me on the field cross the street in fear because they couldn't recognize who I was. So that's the duality that a lot of black men have to live with. And um, I'm sure a lot of brothers here on the panel can identify with that. Michael, can you speak to, uh, to, to what Byron has just shared? Have you experienced that? Uh, I, I know that's a rhetorical question, you know, in terms of being a black man in America. Um, but can, can you speak to that and, and share your, your insight, your experiences? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a 6'2", 300 plus pound black man in America. So um, I think that you for a long time, you know, until you heard me speak, uh, then there was an assumption of all kinds of things, right? Um, and sometimes even after I spoke, <laughs> there was an assumption about all kinds of things. Um, I, I, I joke with people that, you know, I'm a post-civil rights baby, I'm 45. Um, so my upbringing was the 70s and 80s and early 90s. And so, in that period, I think there was this kind of optimism and this belief um, and respectability that, okay, we got these civil rights laws passed. Now, if we can just get our education, if we just speak a certain way, if we just dress a certain way, you know, and I was very steeped and reared in that kind of respectability, especially as a Midwesterner from Chicago. Uh, and, you know, I, I joke with people that on some level, I owe my consciousness to the police because you know, I was dressed as a preppy black boy who spoke well and was doing good in school when the police stopped me, threw me on the hood of their car and then stop and frisk before it was called stop and frisk. And at the time, you know, I didn't know better not to speak back to the police in that way. And I was very rebellious in my words and talked about, you know, there's people in the corner right there selling drugs. Why are you bothering me? Like, you know, doing that kind of emotional distancing that people can do with black men. Um, and I'm like, I'm in school, I'm doing well, you know, mm -hmm. these people like, they, they, the police were laughing. They thought it was hilarious, right? Like that I was speaking in this way. And I was like, that's why I'm going to school. So I don't have to deal with stuff like this. And the cops said, you know, as long as you black, you always have to deal with this stuff. And when I went home and, you know, and told, and I was literally in front of my grandmother's house. I just come from the corner store. And when I got in the house and I told my grandmother what happened, her reaction wasn't against the police. Her reaction was against me. Like her reaction was, you said what to the police? You spoke what? You know, do you know, go call your mama. She got to, you know, and I call my mama. I'm thinking she's going to have my back. And she's like, the Chicago Defender comes out with a list of names of black boys and black men who are killed every year by the police. What are you doing? And I'm like, y'all didn't tell me any of this. So I think that there was a generation that didn't get the education um, and had to find out about how white folks work in this country firsthand. And from that moment on, I'd, I'd start doing my own research and became my own revolutionary. But, you know, I, I, I was on my path to be the next Clarence Thomas, the next black Republican who believed that all lives matter bull. Mm -hmm. You know, and you brought up something very important. Um, well, one, first and foremost, uh, we, we are re reared to respect the law. You know, we're real, reared to uphold the law and, and don't say anything that's going to you know, get you in trouble. Don't fight back. You know, those types of things. But there comes a point when you're tired of, of, of not saying what is on your soul to say in defense of yourself. Um, and and I, it's not that I think I know that we as a people have gotten to that point. You know, it, 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 it's time out now. We've, we've got to make some changes. And until these changes are made, people will continue to protest. People will continue to speak out. People will continue to honor their humanity. Um, and so it's just very critical for these kinds of conversations to take place so that we can speak and honor our humanity. Um, our guest Earl has popped off. We're having just a few technical difficulties tonight, you guys, but please bear with us. Um, Joseph Collier is now with us. He's a retired educator and um, ally activist for, for, for the cause. So Joseph, I know you're a retired educator. What has been your experience in, the, in, in education in terms of being, were you a teacher? Were you an administrator? Yeah, teacher. You're an educator. Teacher. Thank you so much for your service. But talk to us, you know, what was 
in, in your time, what was it like being a black male teacher in your school district? Well, first and, of all, and how many were there of you? Oh, first of all, thank you so much for including me on this panel. I'm just really um, honored to be with you guys. I was an early childhood teacher, and that was by choice because most of the uh, African-American men were going to high school, but I didn't feel that at that point I needed to be with the early grades, the younger ones, because sometimes when you get to high school, you're trying to refix things that may not have been right for those young students. So there was only like two men that taught early childhood in my building. And I did that for 20 something years. But I was blessed to have principals who say, you must teach about social injustice in the classroom. And we were allowed to do that. The majority mm -hmm. of my students were African-American or uh, Hispanic Americans. And some of them were being discriminated against because most of their parents were not citizens. They moved here from Mexico and you had all this together to teach them, this is what may happen. So when we would go on field trips, she said, tell them what might happen. And they experienced that. But you have to, it's sad that you have to prepare five and six and seven year olds for that. But we had to because we in Dallas, Texas, is, uh, I've always thought that Texas sometimes is 20 years behind the rest of the nation in, in uh, uh, civil justice. And, and uh, But what happened was that we had these young children who were saying, why did he say that to me? Why, why did they look at me? Why did they push me out the way when we were in line to get our treats at the zoo? So why did they, so you have to teach them, this is what may happen but this is how you have to respond because if you respond like you do on a playground, something else may happen. And it kind of sends mixed messages to those young children, but you got to do it because if they don't know, they're not going to know how to navigate and how to deal with it, even at their young age. So that's what my experience was, is to, to teach about everything regarding them as African-American and Hispanic American children. This is what you may be up against, even in education. You know, and it's so important. I appreciate uh, you and Michael bringing up this whole uh, idea of, of teaching children before <laughs> they walk out the door. It's unfortunate, but it is our reality. But in the school system, you know, we, we, we have been denied our history in terms of public education. Uh, and so it's, it's upon us as moms, dads, aunties, uncles, whatever your role is, is to teach our children. I know when I started graduate school, you know, I was, I was much like you, Michael, you know, I was, people told me that I was, you know, trying to be preppy, trying to be white, trying to do all this stuff that I wasn't, I was just being me, you know? Um, and the places that I experienced on, on a middle school level, you know, it did much to, 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 Form opinions, you know, um, and it wasn't until I started graduate school I said that just I didn't have this this knowledge of self. I, I didn't have the knowledge of self. But when I started graduate school at an HBCU and started learning about my history, and it's unfortunate it took me what I guess I was 25, 26. It, it's unfortunate it took that long, but it did, and I was angry. I was I was look. I was I was militant. I was I was just angry because I was not told these things, you know. Um, and so it's so important that we tell our children who they are and where they come from. I, I know, Earl, you have children. What has that dialogue been about? Have they have they seen the video? Have they asked questions? Have they seen the, the rioting? Have they been curious at all about what's going on in America? Earl, can you hear me? Can you repeat that question for me? Yes, yes. So you're, you're coming in just a little. I didn't hear the question. Certainly, certainly. I know you have children. Um, have they seen the video? Have they seen the rioting in the streets? What are you telling them? How are you explaining uh, what's going on in America to your babies? Yeah, if I'm if I'm correct, you're asking me about what do we need to share with the children? In terms That's of correct. Of going on now and what you are correctly. telling your children well i think right now 
Well, my, my children, interestingly enough, um, just to give some background, my children are very young. They are 10 and 11. And my daughter shared with me probably about a year ago, she asked a question to me. She said, why is Donald Trump a racist? Now, this is interesting because you figure at 10 years old, most kids are somewhat oblivious to issues of race and not that we hadn't had that conversation with her, but for her to be so specific and so pointed, you know, when a child asks a question, that's the moment when you have to share with them. And I found that one, she was probably more ready than me to have the question because I did not really want to essentially at 10 years old have to share that with her. But explain to her just exactly what racism was. And interestingly enough, I asked her, what did she think racism was? And she says, well, that's when white people don't like black people. And not going into such a very deep explanation in terms of racism, I shared with her, yes, that's part of it. I said, but it's more so about power plus prejudice. And I said, the thing about racism is that individuals, and unfortunately in this country, white folks have had a particular level of power uh, institutional power, and it's allowed for them to do certain things that we might not have been able to uh, overcome or get around, and it has posed many different issues. Now, this is me as a father, and I'm, I'm an older dad, trying to explain to my daughter, who actually has a perspective, but is trying to wrap her mind around what is it that's going on, and you know, I don't come from a particular type of family that's dealing in this matter, and why am I seeing these things on the news? Why am I getting this information even, you know, out in society? And for me, it was a very hard conversation to have with her at a very early age. So I share that background in terms of what this moment happens to be and how hard it must be for many parents in our community explaining to their children who essentially for the last roughly uh, eight, eight years, if you will, in terms of them growing up, Barack Obama happened to be the president. Now, what was interesting is that even while he was president, there were many men of African descent who were being murdered by police and the essential level of you know, police brutality and so on. And these things, somewhat of a juxtaposition, if you will, in terms of this monumental event of these children growing up with an African-American president, but then dealing with the reality that just because one is a president doesn't mean that life for everybody in society is, is, is going to be positive. So the teachable moment right now is really being very honest, which, you know, in our community, we've always been honest. I don't think uh, other communities have really understood the essence of power and prejudice, and, you know, maybe they do. But at the end of the day, and part of the decriminalization, if you will, of black bodies, the issue now becomes taking this so-called criminality out of the conversation with black men. The question becomes, where did that come from? Oftentimes, when we come together, it's all about, well, what can we do? What can we say? What can we share to make things better? I don't play the victim role, if you will, but people of African descent in the United States of America are not ones perpetuating the madness or killing individuals, whether that be one police officer with the last event that we've seen, or if that's going back to 1619. There is a, whole, a wholesale change that needs to come about. Our bodies have been sacrificed for so many years that it's only going to take other individuals recognizing their privilege, recognizing their power, and figuring out how they need to change. We have enough other than trying to be right and exact. And let me just pivot somewhat in reference to Drew Brees' conversation within the last 24 hours. Drew Brees made the conversation about the flag and about his grandfathers and about uh, how, he, how they fought, and you know, he's not going to allow anyone to disrespect the flag. This conversation is not about disrespecting any flag of any nationality. This is about the humanity of a people that has been disrespected for quite some time. And only until white folks and other folks who don't have an understanding as to who they are, because we know who we are, but until they have a better understanding and engage us in a much more different way, we're going to continue to see this problem. But I, but I will say this, teaching these children to recognize their self-worth, recognizing that our history did not start in 1619. We have a much more broader perspective in terms of the history that we come from. And if we can really be seen within the, the context of humanity in terms of what we've been able to extend, that's where I think, number one, our children get a better perspective as to who they are and where they fit in society. 
and are able to communicate with other people, other societies, uh, other cultures, other ethnicities, because that is the foundation of number one, being civil, understanding the essence of yourself. And the, the, the roundabout understanding of what civilization is in, in terms of our humanity, it's about being able to extend ourselves across the, across the board and vice versa. But these conversations have not been had with other people. And, and let, 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 I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. These conversations have been had. They're not being paid attention to. And we keep telling each succeeding generation the same thing. So until, again, other folks, you know, whether it be white or others, if they can just recognize their privilege, if they can just recognize the things that have happened. And let me say this. I was pulled over about two or three months ago. No big thing. I was out of stop time. And I went just a little bit over the white chalk line. A police officer um, had happened ha had happened to stop as well, but he pulled me over because I just pulled up just a little bit. I mean, it wasn't a major offense, if you will, but there was no reason to pull me over. And what ended up happening was when I rolled down the window, when he got to the window to ask for my information, he saw an older gentleman. I'm, I'm in my 50s. I have a gray beard. Now the question becomes, what if I was younger? What if I didn't comply? Would I be a hashtag? And this is something that black men deal with day in and day out. And what's unfortunate is that our bodies, neurologically, if you will, in terms of what we deal with and what we have, have had to endure, we are not supposed to think and feel in the manner in which we do. Any black man will tell you when a police officer goes by him, he might grab onto the steering wheel a little harder or he's looking back in the rear view mirror to make sure he's not going to turn around. That level of, of, of intensity in terms of recognizing that we might not come home is something that we've been dealing with, not just in 20 years, it's been going on for quite some time. So there's a whole energy, there's a whole bodily functionality, if you will, that we go through that is actually accepted as the norm for us. And that is not how it's supposed to be. And you know, Earl, because there are no other people who are thinking like that. So I, that, that's, that, that's my, my, my comment just in terms of the teachable moment right now. We're still having to have that so-called talk with our sons and our daughters and we should not have to do that. And, and you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate because I've had that experience. You know, I was driving down the interstate enjoying my music and you know, I was going a little faster than I should be, should have, should have been going. And I see flashing lights behind me. I, I feared for my life and I had to pray and say, Lord, please just get me home safely. And it's unfortunate that in this day, you, me and others like us have to have that prayer when we send, when we send them, see those flashing lights behind us. It's, I can become very emotional and tears will flow. So I'm going to come on and ask you, Fahamu, um, what is the blueprint? What does this look like? You know, we have our uh, white friends. I have beautiful white friends who are asking questions. Um, what has been that conversation? What has that conversation been like for, for you in terms of, of, of you being asked and people wanting to know more? And how have you approached that? Yeah. Um, well, uh, be before I respond to that, I just want to kind of touch on a, a couple of things that have been said by some of the other panelists uh, mm -hmm. as they were speaking. Um, and, and, and there's something uh, to all of the, the comments that I think we need to point out, especially when we talk about Black livelihood. Um, and for the most part, Black livelihood has been uh, engrossed in the practice of surviving, period. We're just trying to survive. We're just trying to make it home. We're just trying to make it through the day. And I think at where we are at this point is that uh, people are fed up with surviving. You know, like as human beings, we have a right to live, to enjoy our lives, to be able to walk in the park and bird watch and not have somebody call the cops on us, you know, to be able to play with a toy gun in a park and not have a cop roll up on you and shoot you. Like uh, those are, that's not a hard ask. Um, and, you know, to your, uh, to the, the point of your question, the, the response that I've had for uh, 
my my uh, white colleagues and um, you know well in, well intentioned uh, you know allies and want to be allies you know who keep saying what should we do? My question is always my response is always to question them back um, because the truth of the matter is what's happening now, what's being said now, what's coming to light now is not news. This is old. It's old. <laughs> and and I've seen in some places people say that they're exhausted by it. Uh, but I, I, I find it difficult to 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 accept that as a expression that I'm exhausted. Uh, because I'm not exhausted. I, I don't have the luxury of being exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I um I share with, with those those colleagues, you know, when they ask that question, um, is it's not so much about what you should do because there's no magic bullet, right? Um it's what are you willing to do? And this is the this goes back to the other comment someone was making about being honest um, about this moment. If we're all being honest with ourselves, we have to be honest about the ways that we have uh, both been harmed by and benefited from white supremacy because it's created apathy in all of us, right? So much so that when we, you know, just like um, uh, uh, when Brother Byron is talking about walking down the street after his um, uh, game and, you know, the white people crossing the street, we do that too, to our own sons. You know, we do that too to our own children because um, we've also been conditioned to, to see uh, first their skin color and then all of the other, uh, you know, misconceptions that we've been fed and conditioned to believe uh, about ourselves, we project onto other people that look like us. And that's tragic, that's tragic, right? And so my question is, what are we willing to do? And when I think about that, I, 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 for me, I'm willing to let it all go. There's nothing that anybody can offer me or share with me or you know present to me that will make me be like, yeah, that's worth, you know, that that weighs more means more to me than this fight, right? Um, because I, I I can't imagine you know two weeks from now sitting down on my couch watching television like, well, that was rough, but you know now it's back to normal, right? Um, and people keep talking about wanting to return to safety and wanting to return to a place of peace. But there never has really been that. It's always been a facade. Um, because as long as people are suffering, as long as people are struggling, as long as there are inequities, as long as there are prejudices, as long as there's racism in this world, um, people will always suffer. And where one person is suffering, we all suffer. It's just a matter of time before it comes to your door. Thank you for that. Go um, Michael. Yeah, I, I, I respond to that comment. Certainly, so, please. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, and to the, the other panelists as well, I mean, there, this moment is cumulative, right? This is a, this response is about an accumulation of experiences and lessons that black people have had for 400 years, both lived and in the blood. I mean, there's a whole field of study called epigenetics that talks about blood memory and how much we pass down trauma through the blood. Mm -hmm. And this isn't like voodoo, this is like real science, right? And, 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 and something that we know from studies done on Jews, quite frankly, and, and their experience with Nazism and how things have been passed down generationally there. So even if we don't have the education, sometimes our responses is from our memory, from our ancestral understanding of, of our experience in this country and the trauma that accompanies that. In order to be able to exist in this country and not hate yourself and not hate your people, you know, for myself, and I talked about my story of having been not woke or not conscious at 16 when I had my moment with the police, it spent the next seven, eight years on learning that those lessons that I have been taught. I, I you know, it took, you know, films like Byron Hurt's films. And um, I had a professor who assigned Eyes on the Prize and we had to watch all 14 episodes of Eyes on the Prize one and two and write one page of analysis. And when you see that, that span of time, it takes us from 1954 to like 1983. And you see year after year, struggle after struggle, decade after decade, the same as the same situations, the same response, I think, you know, you know, you can go back to respectability even isn't new. Like you had people in Ida B. Wells's day, black people 
advocating and supporting lynching, right? Like that was a real thing that there were some black people who were supportive of lynching and said some of the similar kind of comments you hear around people putting out black on black crime BS, right? Like, well, what, what did they do to get lynched? Like, what? I mean, like that, that would be ridiculous to us now to hear that kind of language. And it's as ridiculous when we talk about what's going on in the black community with each other. And, you know, the response I always have when people get crazy with that kind of conversation is that black people are the number one people involved in anti-violence programs in this country. We run the most anti-violence programs in this country. We run the most human rights programs in this country. Like, like we have been doing that work. So if a white ally or so-called ally or wannabe ally comes to me, I'm like, just like I had to do the work of reading and to unlearn and watching documentaries to unlearn the conditioning that this country has given to me, you have to do the same to unlearn the things that you have believed about me both consciously and unconsciously. And that's not on me. Not, mm. It's not on us as a community. That's on the people outside of us who run this country, who has you know, a benefit from the status quo. And so, yeah, I mean, I do think we get the right to be exhausted, but I also think we don't, we, you know, we've never had the luxury of being able to give in to that exhaustion, right? Like if we want to continue to just survive, to just get through another day. But I do think these protests are a matter of accumulation of like every lesson, you know, and I think the final lesson was like Colin Kaepernick just got on his knee and that wasn't enough. Like we couldn't even get on a knee. And it's like, if we can't get on the knee, just burn it all down. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 You know, Let it go. But you know, I, I wanted to say one, 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 one quick thing too before, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, uh, Mr. Collier. Uh, but I was just thinking earlier today about the, the psychological impact of labor um, in, in this country, right? And especially when we think about the disparities uh, uh, between black people and white people. And for so long, the, the dirt work, the grunt work, the hard work, the backbreaking work, the sweat, the blood, the tears, has all come from black bodies. And when now when, when people are being asked to do that work that you know both myself and, and, and Michael are talking about, they're still looking for black bodies to do that work for them. Oh, what, what, what program should I be, where, where should I get my, do the work? You know, what are you willing to do is the question. Well, how far are you willing to go? What are you willing to admit? You have to do that work. I can't do it for you. I, I, I've been doing it, but I can't do it for you. You know, I, 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 I really take issue when, when well, white people ask me, so what can we do? And I want to ask them, so what have you been doing? Right. So what, this is not new to you. Uh, this protest of this magnitude is new to you. It's your responsibility, as, as Mr. Venable said, it's your responsibility to find out what to do. It's like you ask a woman who's been attacked by somebody and they arrest him and they come to her. So what can we do so he won't do this again? No, it's what can you do so you so it won't happen again? And and it's easy for them to take that that attitude. Well, so what can we do so so we can have peace and harmony in the world? And I just look at them like, what do you think you should do? You should know you know what to do, but you have not done it. But it want, I want to rest on your body. I've abused your body. I've done it for 400 years. But now it's up to your body to determine how we can stop doing it. And I really have a big issue with that, to ask me that. Byron, what, what has the conversation, well, first, let me first and foremost, um, if, for the audience that's watching, if you want to learn more about my guests tonight, please follow their social. It's uh, included in the description of this broadcast. and. For those who have questions, follow these profiles because in them you will be educated. Um, but Byron, um, you are to me one of the foremost thought leaders as, as far as I'm concerned uh, around this whole uh, conversation about black equity in America. Um, 
what kinds of conversations are you having among not just your white colleagues, but your colleagues of, of, of African descent? What, what are you all talking about? How are you offline? This is all offline. How are you, how are you engaging? And what is that conversation like um, in your circle? Well, I'm in a, a really amazing uh, group called the Men's Roundtable. And we have conversations around, um, you know, black maleness um, in the age of COVID, during the era of COVID-19, and now um, in the wake of Ahmaud Arbery, Brittany Taylor, and uh, George Floyd. Um, uh, and Brianna Taylor. I'm sorry, what, I'm sorry, Brianna Taylor. What did I say? I'm sorry. Brittany. You said I'm sorry, Brittany. I'm sorry, yeah. Brianna Taylor. Excuse me, Brianna Taylor. Um, and so, uh, so we've been having a lot of really um, powerful conversations about how we feel. The conversation is not about what we think, not about what problems need to be solved, or how to solve this particular problem of white supremacy, but what do we feel inside as black men? And um, it's it's very revealing, you know. We had a conversation last night, and the thing that I walked away with is that black men are very angry right now. Uh, black men are very um, frustrated, very, um, uh, they're, they're trying to resolve their emotional feelings during this time frame um, where, you know, we, there's so much uncertainty, there's um, a lot of death, there's a lot of destruction. And so, and protests and resistance. And so a lot of young, young men and older men as well are just, have, they just have a lot of overwhelming and very powerful feelings. And most of it resol re revolves around anger right now. Um, so those are the conversations that I've been having. I mean, just brothers just really trying to struggle to get through the day um, dealing with their complex emotions, um, helping to uh, address feelings and concerns that their children have, um, that their wives are having. Um, and so, you know, those are the conversations that I'm having with black men. And I apologize for um, for not saying Brianna um, Taylor's name correctly. She's as significant as every other um, black male who has been uh, murdered. And so I did not mean any disrespect by that. So thank you for correcting me on that. Um, but the one thing I wanted to say is that, yeah, I, I've had a lot of white people approach me. Um, they've, they've been DMing me. They've been texting me. They've been calling me more. I've heard from from old white teammates that I haven't heard from in 30 years. And I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, you calling me out of the blue, you know, to, to talk about, about these issues now. Um, and I think a lot of it is because they want to resolve their own white guilt. I think that's, that's part of it. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's another part um, where, you know, again, they're, they're trying to get me to do the work for them. I just tell them that you need to go get your people. I mean, plain and simple, like you go get your people, okay? I will work and I will resist against the white power structure. I will organize, I will galvanize my community. Um, I will help my community with the tools that they need to, to fight this system of white supremacy. But what I need you to do is go back and I need you to have conversations with white people and I need you to do the work of undoing racism. That's the work that you need to do. That's what's needed right now. Um, and I agree 1000% that, you know, uh, when white people ask these questions, what can we do? How can we achieve peace? How can we achieve equality? They know the answers to those questions. They have to stop being racist. Their, their, an their ancestors built this system, right? They passed this, this system down. They, they understand the privileges that they have. They may say that they don't, but they understand that white supremacy is a system where that, that bases white supremacy essentially says that they are inherently superior to black people, right? And so in order for them to uh, to disrupt racism, they have to give up. They have to be willing to give up those privileges and they're gonna have to be willing to take the risks of losing you know, all of the, um, the power that they've gained after generations of black people doing all that labor for them. And, and on that note, Earl, I'd like for you to, well, before we go to you, Earl, I know uh, Fahamu and Michael have to have a hard stop at eight. So I want to pose this question to you two first. Um, and then Earl, I'd like to come back and talk about your research. Um, so Fahamu, Michael, is it possible for America to course correct after having 
At its helm, Donald Trump, who has incited and encouraged hate among the American people. I think it's possible for America to come back, but I, I mean, I think to Byron's point, um, you know, it's hard for me to have faith or have trust um, in the people that say one thing, say, you know, plead ignorance, plead a lack of knowledge, plead a lack of awareness, but are fully aware when it comes time to call the police on black bodies, right? Like, you know, over and over, we've seen the Karens, quote unquote, pick up the phone and weaponize their race um, and assume that the state will have their back. That assumption that the state will have their back in retaliation for the slights and perceived slights, not real slights, or just prejudice that the moment of the moment um, is one that suggests that there's some really deep and profound work that has to happen on the part of white people. I mean, as some, you know, right now I'm, I'm more interested in, in, in kind of as a black gay man who is here representing an LGBTQ plus community, you know, this week we had um, Ayana Dior beaten by other black people, a trans woman beaten by other black people brutally in a mob attack. We had a black trans man murdered, I believe by the police. Um, you know, so we, I, I'm more concerned right now, like how do we deal with our own trauma within our community to help each other while we also dismantle and do the work of undoing racism in the state. Um, but in terms of the, the system, uh, the system is so insidiously embedded, corrupt, through and through with white supremacy. Um, it's it's hard. It's hard to have faith. Derek Bell wrote books back in the 90s, Professor Bell, mm -hmm. saying that, you know, racism was going to last forever. Like to his death, he did not believe that there, that this country really had a vested interest in undoing what it knew to be true, despite the fact that it may end up being the undoing of this country. I mean, right now, globally, we don't have a lot of friends. We've alienated some of our allies. Um, there are protests going on in, our, in support of us. There have been some calls of divestment in America, the same way there were calls for divestment in South Africa in the 80s. Uh, <laughs> you know, like racism literally may be on the undoing of the entire country. Um, and even still, there's still like this pleading of ignorance. So. I don't have a lot of faith, but I'm going to continue to do the work that I, I need to do in my community to make sure we love and take care of each other um, and continue to resist. Tom, can we course correct? Uh, you know, I, I was I was thinking about what I wanted to say uh, to this question. And the, the, the thing that comes to mind uh, uh, most profoundly um, is uh, back in um, uh, 2016 or whatever when you know that orange dude uh, was elected the the day after you know uh, I remember seeing people crying and people were you know just really upset and up in arms and they couldn't believe what happened oh my god I can't believe he won you know kind of thing and I, I, I wasn't surprised uh, you know what I mean I, uh, I wasn't happy about it but I wasn't surprised um, but I remember writing something on my Twitter uh, at that time that perhaps, you know, this dude would be the, the thing that wakes us all up, you know, and in a really sort of perverted way, uh, he has, you know, there is no hiding behind the American ideal of itself anymore. Uh, America has sold us a vision of itself and has sold the world a vision of itself that as black people, we've known all of our existence was untrue. And now everybody gets to see, it's like the Wizard of Oz and Toto just pulled the curtain back. Mm. Um, and we see the man behind it, you know, thing smoking a cigarette and, you know, is nothing like what, uh, he or America projected herself to. Fahamu, are you still speaking? Hello, Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, I'm sorry. I think you went out on me. Okay, yeah. Are my, you still speaking? My, my AirPods died. <laughs> uh, okay. 
but yeah, I was just saying, I, I don't even know if we should even be so much concerned about course correcting as much as we are about just correcting. Because it's not about trying to go back to the course of what was. Um, that didn't serve us. And it didn't serve a lot of people. It doesn't serve a lot of people. And again, we're seeing that play out more and more and more. We're seeing the fallacy of what America has proposed or purported itself to be. Um, and so rather than trying to course correct, let's, let's burn it down and build it correct. Um, you know, and, 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 and then we, you know, I think we have much more uh, generative uh, conversations from, from that point. Start anew, start afresh, build yeah. it from the ground up. Yeah, I mean, create create it, new systems. It's, it's built with, with, with flaws embedded in it. Like the system isn't broken. There's nothing broken about this system. It's doing exactly what it was set up to do. We just happen to be the ones that it was set up to do it too. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Fahamu. Um, we have a question from the audience. Uh, they want to know, and Michael, uh, Fahamu, whenever you have to leave, I do understand. Um, what are your thoughts regarding the president instituting the insurrection law, and what does that lead to? What What is the in, end game, if you will? Brian, can you lead off with that? Well, my personal take is that um, 45 um, has... His, his goal is to project an image of strength and power and control over these um, black led bodies, right? The people who are rebelling against the racism and against the police brutality and just the, the, um, the, the, the ongoing social inequality in this country. And so, um, He's, he's sort of creating these, they're not even laws, right? I mean, he's just saying these things, you know, to dog whistle to his base, that he's in control, that he is the person who's going to control these black people, even though he doesn't really have the power to invoke that act, right? To actually make it happen. And that, you know, most governors won't agree to do it, even if he, you know, uh, mandated it, right? And so um, I just think that, you know, his 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 main goal is to perform a certain kind of manhood and white manhood and white masculinity that speaks to his base, right? And that says, I'm in control of these black bodies. And so with that, uh, Joseph, what are your thoughts around you know, you know, it's 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 a source of much anger and much frustration to even consider, to even consider, and this has been throughout our history, that someone feels that they have the power to wield their power on on us and to do the things that they think is necessary or correct in our abuse, our treatment, our our um, and, and, and the prejudices that are projected upon us. So Joseph, what are, what are your thoughts about this, this notion that the quote unquote leader of the free world uh, feels that it is his right and his duty to implement a law that he has no power to implement? Well, he, he's speaking to a base that I, I actually believe is, is not as strong as its country. Uh, it's his base. It's his people who are the, as I would call them, the dying breed of racism. But we must understand that racism is just the sheep's clothing for the wolf and the wolf is hatred. So they call it racism, but it's really hatred. So like uh, was said earlier, the idea that I don't have the ruling power uh, that, that white people normally are used to having I've got to do this so it won't happen again. I've got to make sure that I keep this before uh, my people. But the problem is with that is, true enough, there he has a following and there are people trying to, 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 to implement that. But the fact of it is, the makeup of this country is we have so many people who are in this country who are not white. 
And the numbers are, even though we're not always in power and control of things, he has to deal with that. And the fact of it is, you can make all the laws you want to, but as long as people are coming to this country who don't look like you, and as long as those young white millennials who are realizing that, hey man, this is not right. That's my, what my grandfather taught because the, the people who are demonstrating in these protests, all of them don't look brown and black. And for whatever reason they're participating in, they're participating to protest. So it's to, to address why he's doing this, it's, it's his last hurrah, he's leaving office and hopefully and prayerfully he doesn't get reelected, but I think he's saying, I'm gonna go out in a blaze of glory even though it doesn't mean anything after I'm gone. Thank you for your thoughts. And with that, um, some of our guests have had to leave, but I wanna close Earl with your research uh, regarding the building of Washington uh, from the perspective of a comedic lens. Uh, we talked about earlier, um, black Africans were brought to this country. Well, they were forced to this country um, and we were used to build and to, to, to create industry, but more times than not, we weren't acknowledged for that creation. So in your research, you talked extensively about um, this comedic lens and the building of, of, of Washington. Can you share a little bit with the audience about that? And following those comments, we will uh, end the broadcast. And before I uh, turn the time over to you, Earl, I just wanna thank everybody for watching. And I want you to know, uh, Anybody can do what we have done tonight. It's, it's about having the courage to have the hard conversations, you know, and, and for black people, it's not hard because it's an experience. It continues to be an experience that we have every day of our lives, but it's up to you. It's up to you to gather your troops, your constituents, your network, the people that you have influence, uh, on to have these conversations um, because that's the only way, that's the only way this sore called racism will heal in America. So like me, you can do this. You can have conversations in your home. You can have conversations in your office. And then, you know, politics and religion, it's, it's kind of difficult to have those conversations there, but if you feel inspired to have them there, have them because until the hard work is done, until the hard work is done, this country will continue on the path of criminalizing black people. And that's not what this country was founded on. You know, uh, the, 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 the constitution, the constitution, I'm just so, I need to go back to school. <laughs> but we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. No, they are created equal by who, who, he who created them, but in the context of policy, in the context of, of equity, no, they're not because black people continue to be killed by law enforcement. And I pray that certainly George Floyd's death, Breonna Taylor's death, Ahmaud Aubrey and so many others' deaths will not be in vain because no parent, no parent needs to be called and told that their, their child has been murdered by, by police. These people, these men and women who have taken an oath to protect and to serve are killing our children. With that, Earl, I'd like to turn the time to you. Talk to us about, talk to us about your research. Really quick, I apologize, I've had some technical difficulties. However, um, what you're asking me in terms of the research on Washington, D.C., it really cir circled around the Egyptian or the comedic understanding in terms of how the actual federal triangle and the actual city in and of itself was created. Uh, it, it surrounded the idea of the Washington Monument, uh, which is based upon the ancient African or comedic, what's called a Tekken, which we more so commonly call an obelisk. And all of the different edifices, the architecture, the cartography, the actual streets, if you will, are all based upon an exactitude that's coming up out of ancient Egypt, which is coming up out of the soul of Africa. 
most of this knowledge and, and wisdom, if you will, that went into creating this country, including the Constitution, if you will, are all based upon ideas that predated 1776 and the creation of this particular country. And unfortunately, much of that knowledge has been lost to time and it's not really out in the public sphere, if you will. However, if you dig in now, there's so many things that you can find that relate to who we are and the greatness in terms of what we've been able to extend to this particular country, it's no wonder why there's an issue with us because we are the ones that assisted with establishing this nation. And I don't mean from the enslaved Africans who actually fought and died, if you will, for this country to become, but the ideas that set the foundation for which the founders actually created the idea of America. Um, interestingly enough, when we look at the right triangle in Washington, D.C., which encompasses the federal triangle, uh, when we look at the, the, the obelisk, and even when we look at the current uh, National Museum uh, that's dealing with African-American history, all of those particular edifices are created in such a manner that speaks specifically to where we come from. And it's the, uh, these ideas that are literally etched in stone in Africa to this day that were implemented in America. Now, the fact that this wisdom, if you will, this, this knowledge that is now part of the urban plan, the actual street layout, the uh, actual edifices, whether it be the White House, whether it be the Lincoln Memorial, uh, whether it be Thomas Jefferson's uh, memorial, all of these particular spaces are very sacred to this country. But interestingly enough, they're very sacred to people of African descent. Because again, this knowledge and wisdom and the manner in which it came up out of ancient Africa is nothing new. And the Europeans who actually created this country understood that and at the very cornerstone of this nation created this idea of America. Now, to somewhat uh, move to the foundation of this idea of this ancient Egyptian uh, thought process that sets the foundation for America, particularly Washington, D.C., there's a story that, that has to be told. It's the story of the god Osiris, who the Greeks call Osiris, and his proper name is Asar, Isis, uh, his wife, his, her proper name is Aset, and Horus, their son, and his proper uh, name is Heru from the African perspective. Well, this is the original, well, one of the original ideas of the, of the Holy Trinity. And in addition, when the story goes with the god Osiris, that his evil brother Set killed him and cut him into 14 pieces. And wherever Aset or Isis, his wife, found a piece of his body, she erected an obelisk in its area to remember and to remind the people that this man who was murdered was good, but he was to be regenerated. Now, when I say he's to be regenerated, the Washington Monument literally represents an African man's phallus. And when we're looking at these ideas, they do not come up out of a European story. They come up out of an African story that finds its way etched in stone in America's capital. Now, what's interesting is that the fact that you have these black men and women who have been murdered roughly since 1619, it is almost as if this story is literally being played out in our nation's capital. And it's extremely unfortunate because this particular story, much of the story that many people of African descent in this country don't know about, is actually shrouded, if you will, in its own personal mystery, its own personal history, but these are the ideas that are not shared in our schools. And in many instances, it's not shared in our homes. So because this knowledge and wisdom is oftentimes not shared, whether it be in the home or amongst other cultures, others have been able to demonize, uh, demonize the, the African body, whether it be male or female, with the essence of our foundation etched in stone in the beginnings of this country. So, you know, as, as we talk about what we can do, as we talk about, you know, uh, this, this deeper history, if you will, it's not that this knowledge and wisdom is not known. The knowledge and wisdom is here for us to engage and to continue to tell the story and, and the truth of who we are. Now, in that instance, that ought to show our humanity in terms of our contribution to the building, not only of this country, but many other civilizations, if you will. And if that was honestly understood, you know, when you saw the, 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 the cops uh, knee on, on, on George Floyd, it wouldn't have happened because he would have recognized his humanity or his cultural contribution to this country, even though they were in Minnesota, not necessarily Washington, D.C. But it is all connected, all of this, in terms of the knowledge and wisdom that we know about ourselves, the knowledge and wisdom that all peoples have about one another, which would actually, yes, bring us together. But unfortunately, in many instances, not all, 
that does not happen. And we continuously have these episodes or these instances where individuals are losing their lives for nothing other than being black. And that's what has to be eradicated. That is truth. That is truth. And that is truth. And until we have the hard conversations, you know, we could talk until we're blue in the face, but we have to have those conversations. And when I say we, you know, I come from a background and the, the mindset that on a spiritual level, because in spirit, there is truth. So on a spiritual level, yes, the God who created us all created us equal, without flaw, without respect of person. However, because of power, because of greed, because of the lack of respect for humanity as it relates to black people, we have gotten the short end of the stick every single time. And that's where this whole notion of equity comes in. Uh, we don't want equal rights because equal is the, the playing field is not equal. We want a playing field that will allow you to soar, that will allow me to soar. And the reason why that, that uh, mindset mentality is debunked by some is because there's this notion that black people won't work for what they have. Black people just want a handout. No, I'm quite intelligent. You know, I can work for what I want, but I need to have a system that's set up that will allow me to access what it is I want so that I can work for it. So Earl, your, your, your points about um, our contributions, actually our integral contributions to the building of this country is critical to this, this discussion as well, because that's part of that history. You know, we've been forced to build, but we're not offered opportunity to excel as a result of the efforts that we've, we've con contributed to this, to this place that we call the United States of America. Uh, gentlemen, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your insight. Um, your life matters. Your life matters to me. And I'm grateful for it. And I'm grateful for the change that you have made, that you are making, and that you will continue to make, not in, only in your homes, but in your communities and in this world. So thank you for your time. And just remember, um, audience, if you have questions, please file those comments below. We'll get back to them. I'll make sure I, I tag those who um, you pose the questions to this so they, they can come back when they're able to, to respond. But thank you for your viewing today. I appreciate it. Share this with your friends. Um, it's important that we have this conversation. And the time is now we honor George Floyd, who was memorialized today. And yes, in the words of his daughter, my dad is gonna change the world. And yes, baby girl, he is. And this shouldn't happen again. This should not, we should not have to have this conversation of another black body taken at the hands of law enforcement. Again, it stops here. It, it, it has got to stop here. We must respect human life and human life includes black life. And uh, I, I encourage you to do the work, to do the research, to, to certainly ask the questions, but do the research. If you need resources, Google is beautiful. It is beautiful. And um, certainly check on your friends. Uh, I have a friend who asked me because truly, and, and I know this impacts so many, um, but from my own experience, it, it, it it, it almost debilitates me, you know, um, it zaps my spirit. And so she asked me, Paulette, what are you doing to hold space for yourself? Well, I was watching the news, you know, trying to stay up to date on all the things that are happening around this case. Um, and so I, I was disconnected from self, but I stayed away from social media for a few minutes. And sometimes you do have to disconnect. You have to disconnect to save your spiritual and your mental peace. And so I encourage you, uh, do what you need to do, but get back in the game. 
get back in the fight. And just one more thing before I sign off. Um, your contribution might not be marching. Your contribution may not be doing broadcasts like this. Your contribution may be in the area of art, like Fahamu. Your contribution might be in the area of creating um, documentaries like Byron. Your contribution might be research, becoming a scholar, or um, finding tools that, that will help you to share knowledge and information with your group. So just understand, <clears throat> everyone's calling isn't the same. Tap into your calling and you will tap into the change that you need and you must be in this world. And with that, thank you all so much for joining me. Thank you. Uh, come back tomorrow, we will be talking about, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> language of the unheard. Protest, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Protest as an anthem to freedom. Excuse me, guys. 